Thanks for joining us for the Long Island Sound Podcast. Each week we explore new music and dive deeper with the artists and their stories behind the music. Please subscribe and rate and review us wherever you stream this podcast. Here's your host, Steve Yusko. Many of us know about the power of music, the power to entertain us, to drive our emotions from sad to ecstatic. And now, music can heal. Today's guest, Renee Bruchard, teaches us about the power of music to heal in her songwriting and in a project that we'll get into. Let's check it out. Hey, I'm really excited about the guest that I have today. Renee Bruchard is an artist, a writer, a musician, and has been living with the effects of a complex trauma and disassociation order for decades. Then in early 2023, she experienced a severe re-traumatizing event that led to an escalation of symptoms, including persistent and disruptive flashbacks. I can't imagine. Uh, And during this time, uh, she was introduced to a psychological model of secondary structural disassociation, which helped her to understand her flashbacks and expression of trauma holding part of herself. And I just want to say this. It's interesting. I've spoken to many artists and many comment that Music helps heal the world, and what you're going to find out in Renee's story is how music heals us all. Renee, welcome to the Long Island Sound Podcast. So good to have you here. Thank you so much, and thanks for giving me a chance to talk about this work. Oh, oh, oh it's, it's, it's my pleasure. It's just, in, in my journey of interviewing people, the stories are just so amazing, so... If you can, give me give me some background of uh, if if you'd like to talk about it, uh, uh, how things came to be, where you are today in your life, and then how the <laughs> healing began. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, I've always been really open about being a trauma survivor, and I do want to just say up front that this project, and in general, um, in public facing materials. I don't include a lot of trauma details. Okay. So you're not going to like hear like terrible stories and ha- or a lot of specificity. I talk more in broad emotional terms and more broad psychological terms for a bunch of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the reasons that's really important to me, though, is that I feel like, you know, trauma is very universal. Right. I mean, especially I mean, listen, we're all living in late stage capitalism, right? We're all. <laughs> traumatized to a certain extent right um you know but everyone's had different experiences and trauma is unavoidable um and the brain has a way of responding to trauma and and sometimes you know in our brain's attempts to protect us some other kinds of other kinds of symptoms or um other kinds of effects uh might persist that could be troublesome or problematic And I never want someone to think that what they experienced wasn't bad enough Mm. for them to have these kinds of things happening in their minds, for them to um, kind of take a hold of some of these tools and and see how it applies to them. And, and, you know, for people to have more tools for living their best lives and living their most authentic selves and and Mm. feeling, you know, more balanced and, and, and maybe less reactive and understanding their own triggers. You know, so I wouldn't want someone to kind of hear the details of my story in this context and think, well, this can't apply to me because nothing like that happened. Because if it affected you, it was enough. Right. You know, uh, you know I, I, agree, <laughs> I agree with you, Renee. And, and I would equate this to songwriting. I, I generally don't ask artists, what's that song about? Okay, because then what I can do is narrow, do tunnel vision on that particular song, and then I'm stealing something from the listener who makes it part of their uh, narrative uh, and their uh, their soundscape uh, in their lives. So I I appreciate that. In that you say, hey, it's 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 more about the tools and recognizing uh, how to cope with it. And uh, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I was just thinking. Um, I went to a church service this morning, and and it was about shame, <laughs> and and uh, and how shame cripples us, uh, and it yeah how how debilitating it is, and 
I became introspective thinking, why do I act that way in that circumstance? And how can I recognize it to handle things better, I guess? So anyway, I don't mean to interrupt. You. No, that was perfect. I think it's so great that you brought up shame because shame is such an important part of healing work. And even really particularly in trauma he healing and in handling trauma related dissociation. You know, um, you know, so for example, let's look at the symptom of flashbacks. Okay. Um, so I had a, like a re-traumatizing event and it brought up a lot of flashbacks from a really particular incident from my childhood. And this was pretty much debilitating. Um, and, you know, of course I work full time and I've got a lot of responsibilities and a lot of things to juggle and it can be really hard to move through your life uh, in this way. And, you know, the way I was handling these flashbacks was really similar to the way I handled them in the past. Mm. Why aren't I over this yet? Why is this still happening to me? I've worked so hard. Um, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I so bad? Um, you know, uh, why am I still so sick? All these kind of like shaming questions. Right, that, dri um, that drive you down a rabbit hole. An yeah, unnecessary absolutely. rabbit hole, right? Yeah. But when I started to learn about secondary structural dissociation, which is a, a structural dissociation is a particular model for trauma related dissociation. And not all psych psychologists use this model. There are a lot of different models, but this one really resonated with me. And when I first started to learn about it in secondary structural dissociation, there's an environment of persistent trauma that could be life-threatening, you know, um, severe. And what happens is that in order for the person to be able to continue to function in the world, um, they, they split. They either, they either develop a split or they're not able to actually ever fully integrate parts of their identity and personality. Interesting. So you have like a social facing part. The term in this model is apparently normal part. I like to call it the getting along in the fucking world part. And then you develop all these trauma holding parts and they hold the memories and the feelings um, and everything around the trauma and they keep it separate so that you can go to school or go to work, you know, do the things that you need to do, not get picked on all the time or whatever it is. Um, and these parts, they express, they kind of become married to different trauma responses and they express that way. So when I learned about that and then a flashback came up, I suddenly saw it differently. And I thought, this isn't me being bad. This is a part of me that doesn't have another way to express. Mm, okay. So instead of being like, no, push away, go, shame, shame and dismissal, I was like, what are you trying to say? Like, I hear you. Okay, I hear you. What's up? <laughs> and this part answered me, really. And, and it said, I just want to be recognized for the fact that I went through this. I want you to see that this happened and, mm -hmm. and acknowledge how terrible it was. And when I understood that, I suddenly had so much compassion for this part. Right. And I also understood that like in my life as a trauma survivor, I get a lot of recognition as being resilient and having overcome and you know, I beat the odds and I'm so successful and all really nice attention. But I don't get a lot of attention that says, you know, that's awful. That no one should have had to gone through that you deserved better than that and i'm not really seeking a lot of that you know although sometimes that's nice but um but that part of me had never gotten any attention hmm. interesting and wow. when i gave it that i i mean maybe i'll have a flashback in the future i don't want to be like oh this is a magic bullet or whatever but the experience was profound right and, and i really haven't had a flashback like that since i started looking at my symptoms through this lens nice yeah and that's what that's really nice is to get your perspective on things and the tools that you do hey let's do this renee let's just take a quick break and when we get back i want to talk about some of the tools because i'm sure i have no doubt 
that there are members in this audience that are saying, uh-oh, I can, uh, I can relate to this. Tell me more. And let, let's talk about the tools that you use and particularly how you tie that into music. Hey, everybody, yes. we'll, be, we'll be back. Hang with us. The Long Island Sound is here to help you connect with local artists. Follow us on Instagram for the latest up-to-date podcast episodes and also to connect with your local artists and their upcoming shows. Hey, everyone. We are back with Renee Bouchard. And Renee has just an interesting story and a wonderful journey. And Renee, can you just give me an idea or some more depth about SSD? Yes. So... First, I do want to say that I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not trained or licensed. I'm a person, <laughs> you know, who um, who identifies with a condition and I've done a lot of study about it, you know, as mm-hmm. a person who, who feels strongly in relation to this model. But so the model of structural dissociation is a spectrum. And first, dissociation is a very, very broad term, you know, in it, and, and it's used in a lot of ways. But in structural dissociation, there's a spectrum that goes from primary structural dissociation to secondary to tertiary. And so in primary, you're talking about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, usually. So what you would have is like a single event And in that event, there becomes a split between this apparently normal part and an emotional part that holds the trauma. And then the goal in therapy might be to reintegrate those parts. Okay. So now in secondary structural dissociation, this is where you're going to find complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And here is where the brain developed in a condition of like persistent ongoing trauma like relational trauma, attachment trauma, abuse, um, okay. neglect, things like that. And so there's such a consistent environment of trauma that the person needs more than one emotional part, more than one trauma holding part to hold all of this trauma. So, and then each of those trauma holding parts can become kind of married to a trauma action system. So you might have like a trauma part that's really all about flight or fight or fawn or freeze or collapse. There's another trauma response called attach cry for help, um, which I've kind of ignored. And, um, you know, I'll talk about that with my therapist. But (laughs) in this project, I really focused on fight, flight, freeze, fawn and collapse. And I named the trauma holding parts for those trauma responses because those are the action systems that those trauma holding parts um, utilize. And this is, you know, really um, consistent with the model of secondary structural dissociation. So you'll have a person that has all these different trauma holding parts and they can be in conflict with each other. They can be in conflict with the A&P. Um, you know, a- you, A&P, I'm sorry. The A&P is the apparently normal part. That front okay. Facing yeah, gotcha. Part. Yes. Sorry. That's the shorthand. <laughs> the, 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 the Facebook of what we show to the world, I would assume. Yes, exactly. Okay. Everything's Absolutely. great. I'm always on vacation. I'm eating great food that doesn't look that great when I take mm-hmm. pictures of it. <laughs> so it could even be as simple as like, I mean, I think everyone can identify to experiences like this. So if you're, you know, just going about your normal day and there's something that triggers you, And then you have what you feel like is an outsized reaction. Maybe you get a little more mad at something that, like, if you kind of think about it, like, why did I get that mad? And maybe you feel like you you couldn't really control how mad you were about that thing. Mm. You know, that's kind of like a little encapsulation of, like, this trauma-holding part coming up. Uh, You know, whatever that trigger was, you know, there was probably a time that that trauma-holding part was formed to deal with something. You know, and that reminded you and then that trauma part came up and had the reaction that is associated with the initial event. You know, and I think that people, you know, I think people feel that like if you've been in a car accident, you know, and then it might be scary to be in a car. Sure. You know, or if you've, you know, if you've been to war, <laughs> right? you know, that's a more extreme example than the 4th of July can be very difficult. All the noise, you know, um, you know, so what? It, uh, yes. So what's interesting, what's interesting in my conversation with artists is 
hey, let's 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 put it on the table. We all have brokenness within us, uh, whether it came upon us or it's developed from all different situations. The human condition has brokenness. How that's dealt with and how that's experienced by social interaction, I'll give you an example, might be, hey, yeah, that guy's got anger issues. You know, he flies off the handle. Does he have anger issues or does he? Or did he experience something that taught him how to react that way as a defense mechanism to say, back off? This is, yes. I mean, we can, we can get deep into the psychological rabbit hole. But what I, I find interest in, uh, people might say, what, what does this have to do with music, Steve? <laughs> the, yeah, the interesting thing that I think is when I've interviewed artists is a lot of times they're speaking about their trauma. It might be in a different persona or character, but it, for me, as an audience member, it always helps me to go, one, not know this backstory in some cases, and I can take this, uh, um, I can I can experience this and go, yeah, I went through the same thing. And how did that person come out from the other side is always the interesting thing. So my question to you, Renee, is this, is seeing this broken, brokenness okay, that, that you're you're dealing with, okay, how did music play a part and how did this how did this become a project? I just said project and everyone's like, yes. what's project? What, what what project? What the hell are we talking about? Yeah. How how, how are you continually yeah. how you continue so speak to the project and how you're using music as a tool um, to get you through to the other side, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yes. So I am a songwriter and I've been a songwriter for many, many decades and you know, back in a previous existence. Um, you know, I was a working musician. I've played all kinds of places, you know, Knitting okay. Factory and CBGBs. And, oh, get you know. out. Really? Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> and then, you know, I got, uh, I decided I wanted to have health insurance. And my <laughs> husband's also a musician. And I was like, you know, we can't have two musicians and own a house. Like, <laughs> Yeah, the, survive, the survival becomes an issue. Yes. Uh, I know so, what you, you know, I got a, a career and I was really lucky to get into a career that I really love. And I kind of put songwriting aside. When my son got a little older, you know, I picked it up again because you just can't really ever let it go. And I really <laughs> right. just did it more personally, you know, just for me. It was just something I was doing for me. So after I had this experience of acknowledging this trauma holding part with the flashbacks, I just mm -hmm. thought, well, that worked great. I think that I should um, ask all my trauma holding parts questions and um, let them answer. And, and I thought about how the trauma holding parts are kind of stuck expressing through these trauma responses. And I was okay. like, what if they had a different language? Hmm. So what I did was I kind of focused on my apparently normal part. And I had that part write like a love song to okay. the trauma holding parts. That was like uh, an invitation to be part of a dialogue. And, you know, and then the idea was then the trauma holding parts would write a song back and we would go back and forth and I would let the parts all use songwriting to express themselves instead of the trauma responses to express themselves. And I would just see if maybe I could foster an environment of compassion and cooperation uh, among these parts that have been kind of um, chaotic and disruptive in my life and, and see if that would help. So that's what I did. So I wrote the first song and I was really proud of it, you know, and I was very excited to embark. And then I kind of looked inside myself and, and thought, where's the answer? What part is going to come up with an answer? Hmm. And it was my fight part that came right up and she was pissed. <laughs> and she was like, this song is some bullshit. <laughs> 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 and she was like, I don't accept this at all. And she wrote this really angry song. And then I was like, which was so much fun, I have to say, <laughs> also. Right. It was really so much fun to, like, sing this angry song and express all this. And, you know, a really interesting thing came out of it, but I, um, which is that the it was almost like a motif, like the trauma holding parts felt like they were being colonized and that they were like the indigenous people of the self. And my apparently normal part was like the colonizer, oh, wow. you know, and, and they were like, no, we're taking the land back, you know, <laughs> and it was very, very interesting. 
Um, but you know, the thing about songs, so much about songs, one thing is that the openness of a song, you know, that there's room for it to change from moment to moment. Mm -hmm. You know, what I thought of it in the moment that I wrote it and what I think of it now and what it means to be now after practicing it and having it in the whole context of these nine songs being completed is very mutable. It, it's very changeable. Um, when a person hears it, you know, they might latch on to an image or something and it might mean something completely different to them. And that meaning can transform over time. And just the transformative nature of songs and the, and the quality of songs to be able to take on different meanings and adapt meaning and allow the listener to participate in attributing meaning. I love all this about songs and I think that it does make it, um, like a particularly resonant healing tool mm -hmm. because healing's not static, you know? And it's interesting because I, I wrote all nine songs, the parts writing back and forth to each other and, you know, making some headway. And um, I got to a place where I was like, okay, I'm going to stop because you've I've got to stop somewhere. I'm like, this is a good enough resolution for now. Okay. And I started practicing the set and I would practice it frontwards, and then I would practice it backwards. And it's, an, it's a cohesive narrative, like, either way. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. You, know what, you, know what, you know what I'm hearing, Renee, in, in, in my conversations with other songwriters? Perspective is certainly uh, plays a part in looking at things. But I've never looked at myself as a compartmentalized person. Maybe that's not the right term, but no, it seems no, like compartments, right? And... Uh, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, there's the forward facing gregarious Steve who's has likes to have fun. There's the hidden, somber, depressed Steve. There's the introspective Steve. You know, sometimes when I look, whether I'm writing something is I'm not thinking in those compartments or I may be in one compartment at the time and not recognize it. So I, I find that, you know, very interesting approach to songwriting songwriting that helps to become a therapeutic tool for yourself and then in the production of it it becomes potentially a therapeutic tool for other people besides putting light on on the situation so i find i find that you know very interesting in how you're approaching things and it's very tangible tell me about the project aspect uh and and how that came about so, what, make, what makes yeah. this a project besides just, hey, I wrote nine songs? <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Um, a, well, a couple of things. And one thing is you really made me think of something, and I, I want to I touch on it, which is that this also was a really interesting creative practice because the trying to get in touch with a certain part and let that part express itself um, means that I was trying not to actually interfere. Mm. Right? Yeah, so, letting it out. Right. And, and I think that a lot of creative people have the experience of being like a conduit. You know, you open yourself up and, and like a muse kind of speaks, like you allow like a creative thing to move through you. Right, and, right. And, and you produce something. So to actually be trying to get in touch with like another voice, another speaker, another creator, and, and stay out of that creator's way. Mm. and let them make something it was very just interesting as a creative practice as well. Um, but I'm a fundraiser uh, for arts and culture um, organizations. And Which, um, give, give, give a plug. Let's give a plug. What? Well, I'm the director of development for the Cinema Arts Center in Huntington. Okay. There um, we go. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of experience in grant writing um, for the arts. And, you know, I was putting this project together and I thought... Um, I thought a couple things. First, I was like, what if I like called in all my favors for myself? <laughs> right. Instead for, of like for, for always a change. trying to connect right. and advance other people and other people's projects. And I also thought, you know, if I wanted to put this together as, as a, a program, at, like an experience, and it's a multimedia experience, actually. Okay. I think that this would be really fundable. You know, so because I've reviewed grants and I've written grants and I see what things get funded and what things don't, you know. You got to say to yourself, how the hell did they get the money for that? Right? <laughs> Usually it's a very fair process. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
I, I went ahead and I applied for a, a micro grant. So I do want to say that this project's made possible with the funds uh, from the statewide community regrant program, which is okay. a regrant program of the New York State Council on the Arts, um, with support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, and it's administered by the Huntington Arts Council. So I applied for that micro grant, and I and I won it. So uh, because of that, I was able to really. Um, make the project a lot more like my vision. So there's a whole multimedia component. I actually had all the parts also make um, little art projects, collages to describe themselves, collages about the songs that they wrote. And all these collages are being printed into a program and everyone who comes to the show on the 20th will get a book of prints. Um, And it's a free show since it's grant supported. and there's a video backdrop um, that's going to play on the big screen uh, behind me while I perform. And I engage the parts in like creating these animated videos. Oh, cool. Segments of the collages. So it's a whole multimedia experience. So it is it is a project. Um, and, you know, and my aim was really to just increase awareness of um, dissociation is a coherent response to trauma Understood. and to reduce, stre- uh, reduce shame and just make community connections, Wonderful. you know? So let's, so those who are watching and listening, look in the description below, you'll get more information and just tell us again, Renee, where and when, uh, the project's kicking off and we'll have a link, uh, a internet link, a web link, uh, as well. And as well as the details that we're Renee's going to talk about now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the show on Saturday, uh, April 20th. Okay. Is that I picked 420 so that no one would forget. um, Is uh, at 3 p.m. at the Cinema Arts Center. It is sold out, but it's a free show. So I'm expecting that there will be drop offs. So there's a possibility if you show up of getting in. But I'm also managing a waiting list. So when you go to the link, um, there will be a waiting list. And I'm going to I'm gonna send an email out to people that reserved and ask them um, if they know they can't come to let go of their ticket. And I will be contacting people on the waiting list for it. But um, also industry in Huntington. Oh, sure. Yeah. They invited me to repeat the show on oh, July wonderful. 11th. Nice. Is, any, uh, is anybody recording the show? At all, or is it? It's just a, a live performance, and you're there, or, or you're square, as they say. Yes, that's right. Uh, no one's recording it, and I really don't uh, generally like to have live shows recorded because I just okay. think I play worse. <laughs> gotcha. I really do. I think I play much, much better if like no one's ever going to hear it again. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, I play my guitar <laughs> in the closet, and I'm great, and that's why they stay in the closet. Yeah, hey, I just I just want to touch on something that that uh, kind of was a trigger for me as far as, you know, you talked about these different compartments and a call and response. But you're allowing it. You know, when I hear call and response, I think about the music genre of um, the blues. You know, I say right. something, you, re- you repeat it back. Like I say something, you repeat it back. But you've kind of turned that on its head in that I've said something. Now I want you to respond to it. and I'm going to let you talk. And I think that's an interesting process in the songwriting aspect. So I'm going to ask you for some tips since you've been songwriting for quite some time. If I were a singer songwriter and I said, Renee, tell me a little bit more about that process. Cause man, I'd like to, I'd like to ape that process and, and try it myself to write some songs. So I don't know if you can put it into words, how oh, you de- develop that call and free response muse i think i'm going to copyright that because i think i can go somewhere with it yeah you should (laughs) i mean you know a lot of it is maybe just like active listening to yourself okay you know i think a lot of it is about getting out of your own way about just not pre-editing okay you know um i mean i'm also a writer of prose and and poetry and articles and and you know i just think a great writing tip is um to not be afraid to be bad (laughs) okay you know just let it be terrible like go ahead and let it because you can fix it later 
yeah. you know, but you don't know what you're going to miss if you if you edit in advance. Right, right. You I know? learned that. Yeah, writing 101 in high school was put it on the paper. Put just put it down. Edit afterwards, and that bring that that brings another question to mind: Is are you the type of person that approaches it? Okay, I'm going to sit down and write a song. Or does the muse hit you and and you and you stop everything and kind of approach it? What? Maybe it's both. I don't know. It's What's your experience? Been? I mean, I have a lot of different, you know, uh, like uh, modes of attack. Um, I think that. Well, another thing though that I want to say, my my favorite writing tip of mine is that um, once you get into writing so- a song, you know, something that has a beginning, middle, and end, you know, I think you should write until you're uncomfortable. Hmm. And then you should keep writing until you've changed. Yeah, that's that. That's a great point because, you know, e- even when listening to a story, whether it's scripture verse or anything, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. The difference is you're a different person now than when you first heard it. Yes. And, and same thing in developing the muse. You're going to be a different person with different experiences, different mood if you say, Oh, that's a gem of an idea. I'll get back to it. That's probably the yeah. curse of songwriting. Never just get back to it. Maybe yeah. editing. Well, I but think it's important to take notes too. And you yeah. know, and that's the thing. So sometimes I'll just be making dinner and a line will come to me and I'll stop and I'll write it down. And, you know, so I've got, um, you know, a journal that's got just a lot of like, you know, partial lyrics and ideas and things. And sometimes I will decide I'm going to write a song now and I'll sit down and I'll say, what do I have here that I can mm. start with? You know, and then I just let that be my my cue, like my jumping off place. Or sometimes I'll get a little riff and, you know, and I'll de- I'll develop the guitar part first. Okay. And then I'll try to fit something into it. And sometimes they come together. Sometimes I'll wake up with a song and the whole right. thing will just come out in like one piece. I hate and that. I hate I, I hate that new people. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, one thing I try not to do, though, is become too precious about it or really belabor it. Okay. So if I start, I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish in like an hour or so. Nice. And very rarely am I going to like tweak it and hang on to it and, 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 and try to make it perfect. Never. You know, one of the greatest things I learned about songwriting was in a ceramics class. Oh, Really? Yeah, and I took this class one day, and then I quit because I thought I'm not gonna be able to apply the attention to this that it really deserves. Okay, and I think I already learned everything I need to know. Which <laughs> Professor Joe he said, um, when you're throwing a pot, you don't throw a pot and work it and work it until it's perfect, because the water will just make the clay collapse and you'll have nothing. You can't make a pot perfect by working it. You throw a pot, and then you throw another pot, and you throw another pot, and you throw another pot, and you throw hundreds of pots, and you're not precious about any of them. You just make it, and you just throw it over your shoulder, and you make another one. Mm. And um, I wrote a song a day for almost three years. Oh, amazing. Wow. You know? I mean, I've written hundreds of songs. I, I actually probably only could play about 20 of my songs. You know, because it's about because it's about the process. Right. See, the difference between you and I, I have about 10,000 starts of a song that are tucked away (laughs) somewhere. And it's just having the uh, (laughs) having the attitude to put them together. Hey, why don't you finish it? Because I'm doing podcasts. You know, I'm busy. I'm a busy man. (laughs) <laughs> hey, Renee, let's do this. Let's take another break. we got more to explore about this. Hey, everybody, stick with us. We'll be right back. Are you ready for the ultimate podcasting adventure? The Long Island Sound Podcast offers you not one, but two ways to engage with our captivating content. Tune in to our audio podcast on your favorite platform and let your imagination paint vivid pictures of Long Island stories. Or if you're craving a visual feast, Catch our video podcast on Spotify and on the Long Island Sound YouTube channel. Double the options, double the excitement. Hey, everybody. We are back with Renee Brochard. Right? Bro- Bouchard. What? Bouchard. B-O-U-C-H-A-R-D. <laughs> you know, bust, I know. Bouchard. Renee, I'm, bust, yeah. I'm busting your chops. Oh, I know how you? to pronounce your name. Come on. Like the Bouchard brothers from Blue Oyster Cult. 
Who are, who are they? Who's blue, who's blue eyes? Oh, those, are those, those are the guys with <laughs> those. Those are the cow, the cowbell, the cow, the cow cowbell guys, right? More cowbell. More cowbell. I always need more cowbell. Totally. All right. Do an uh, do an introduction into a couple of songs, and then we'll come back again, and then we'll kind of wrap okay. it up. All right. All right. It's all you. It's all you, baby. All right. Well, I'd really love to share a couple songs. One of the great things about this project is it's reunited with me with my old guitar player, David Romanelli. So back in the 90s and the early 2000s, David Romanelli and I put out a couple independently produced albums. We played a lot of great shows. And uh, he's um, he was following my project on social media and he wrote amazing parts for all these songs and we've been practicing together so when you come to the show you'll be able to hear David he's amazing and David and I have gone into the studio a little bit recently and I'd love to share a couple of songs um, one of them is called I Don't Write and this is a song I wrote uh, while I was doing a covers project I had decided to cover a song from every year of my life. So 1968 to 2022 is when I did this project. And I got to a certain year and there was a song and I can't remember. I was considering covering this song and the song was like, I'm so glad I'm writing again. And I got so bothered by this song that I uh, stopped and I wrote an original song for the first time in a long time at that period, uh, which is called I Don't Write. So I'd love to share <laughs> that. Wonderful. So everybody, let's have a listen to I Don't Write, and we'll be right back after the song. Stick with us. another song that David and I uh, worked on recently. This is a rough mix. The song is called Mother's Day. Um, and I will just uh, let you imagine how that relates to a trauma project. Ooh, good, good cliff, good cliffhanger there. Hey, everybody, let's listen to 
Mother's Day. We'll be right back after the song. My mother is a pile of invoices, receipts, unopened envelopes from insurance companies that I let sit in the dark until I feel it's too late enough to throw. everyone. We're back with Renee. And in listening to Renee's journey and story, something came to mind. And it's a Japanese art and it has to, it ties into Renee talking about her pottery class and the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with gold is called kintsugi. I hope I'm pronouncing it right, which literally means join with gold. And what I found so interesting and talking about as a human and all of us have brokenness where there's artwork that can take broken pieces, put them back together with gold and it becomes more valuable than the original piece. And that's what I think, uh, Renee, your um, one, your story and you articulating uh, the tools in order to help you and help our audience member is the gold that'll uh, help put the pottery back together and make it uh, even more valuable. That was so beautiful and perfect and so funny that I actually have a song about that. Oh, come on. <laughs> we did not talk about this before the show, did we? <laughs> I do. So uh, uh, it's called Broken. <laughs> and, um, and, the, and the chorus is put the pieces back together with gold. Oh, my God. See, it was... <laughs> It was meant to be. Hey, Renee, it was my pleasure to have you on the Long Island Sound podcast. I look forward to meeting you in person and best of luck with the project. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. This was really great. You were wonderful, a wonderful host. I really appreciate that you gave me this time. Thanks. You're being too kind. All right. Until next time, everybody, take care. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time you spent with us. Please subscribe and comment and visit us at gigdestiny.com. Till next time, 
be generous with your joy, keep your spirits high, and let the music take you on a journey. Be well. Peace. Thank you.